Well, aging is just like every other condition that causes us to be sick and eventually die. Uh, we like to think it's natural because it happens to most people. But in 100 years ago, cancer, heart disease, frailty, these are things that, that if you lived long enough, you would get. Uh, and eventually, we learned how to treat those things. We understood what the basis was. And we're at the same stage with aging. We now have, a, for the first time, a fundamental understanding of what causes aging, how to slow it down, and even potentially how to, how to treat it and reverse the process. And my argument about why we should focus on it is that aging is the major cause of all of the diseases that we try to stop. And instead of trying to whack them on the head one at a time as they emerge, why don't we try to stop us getting to the edge of the cliff in the first place before we drop off? Well, it's completely historical. The medical profession has built itself up to treat things that are already occurring. We call these things diseases. But the only difference between a disease and aging is that a disease happens to less than 50%, and aging happens to 50% or more. And I think that's just, we know that's a completely arbitrary distinction. So it's historical. And in 30 years from now, I'm certain that we'll look back at today and think, why did we ignore this major problem on the planet? And why didn't we work on this sooner? What we've been doing as a field is publishing in the world's leading journals about what's driving aging. But we've also discovered that there are genes in our bodies that protect us from aging. We call these longevity genes. And there's a set of genes that we work on in my lab at Harvard called the sirtuins. And for those to work effectively to slow aging and prevent us from getting diseases, they need a molecule called NAD. And you can take supplements that will raise NAD levels in the body, but we only know so far that they work really effectively in animal studies to slow down aging and give uh, the benefits of exercise and diet without actually having to do that. But we're right in the middle of clinical trials. Some are being run at hospitals at Harvard, some around the world. And we're hopeful in the next year or so we'll have some first true evidence, not just that it's safe, which we know already so far, but that it actually helps to do some of those things that we see in those mouse studies. So it's a very exciting time. And there's, there's hundreds of studies around the world looking at molecules in people to see if we can actually slow down the aging process. Uh, well, just to be clear, I'm, I'm not taking anything that isn't available um, to the general public. These are supplements. Um, but supplements have a drawback, which is my pr primarily we don't know if they work yet. Um, and this is the problem. And so that's why I'm working on these clinical trials that would eventually produce a drug that a doctor could prescribe, knowing that in most people, or at least uh, a number of people, it's proven to work. And initially, it'll be prescribed for treating diseases, because aging is not yet a prescribable condition. Uh, but why hasn't the world adopted this yet? Well, because we need to prove that these things work. And right now, because things look very promising, Many of us, including my family, have decided to take the risk that uh, if we don't do anything, that's even worse, we think. Um, but yeah, it's, it's still a risk. There's still a chance that there could be side effects that we haven't seen yet. Right. Well, I'm 103, <laughs> give or take a few. No, honestly, I'm, uh, I'm, I just turned, I wish. Uh, so I, I just turned 50. And so you can be the judge. I don't have any gray hair yet. I look even more amazing considering I grew up in Sydney, Australia sunbathing uh, and getting really burnt. And I really should be totally wrinkled. So, so far, so good. But that's not proof that this is working. That said, I'm not an athlete. I don't do a lot of exercise. I wish I had time for that. But my physiology, as far as doctors can tell, so there's a cocktail of a few things that we've been taking based on my lab's research and some many others uh, around the world. And, but the NAD booster molecule I've been taking for a few years now. Well, every molecule we put in our bodies, even food, is, has a risk. You know, there are pesticides in food. So it's on a scale of, of a risk. And uh, we think that these are on, on the, the low end of, of the risk scale, because the molecule that I take and my father takes is naturally occurring. Our bodies make it. And re really, we're just aiming to supplement what we're losing over time and get us back up to a youthful level and the sort of levels that you see in athletes and people who um, don't eat. Uh, three meals a day, which we think is also very helpful. We know that if you calorie restrict or have intermittent fasting, um, many studies around the world in people and, and mostly in animals 
uh, prevents aging. Um, and so you can either do that or you can take these molecules. Um, but the, the growth hormone does the opposite. It actually speeds up your body's growth at the expense of, we think, at the expense of turning on longevity pathways that we study. So uh, in my view, growth hormone, while it has some great short-term benefits, you will get stronger, you'll have less chance of falling, which is great for the elderly. Um, in the long run, which is what I'm looking at here in my research, um, it's, it's like growth hormone would be like burning the candle at both ends um, instead of putting energy into long-lasting body. It's, it's only been around for a couple of years now that we've learned that we can reprogram the body to really be young again, not just temporarily, but we think um, a true reset. We found a, a backup hard drive of, of youthfulness in cells, and we use a gene therapy currently. And in mice, which is our, our field's go-to organism, uh, we can do things like reprogram the eye. We can put a, three genes into the eye and turn them on for a few weeks, and those old mice will regain their vision. Uh, but we don't know the long-term consequences. Uh, but it is exciting, at least in principle, that we found that there is a backup copy of youth that we can turn on and reset the function of something as complicated as an eyeball. Well, yes, we are. So th what I think is causing aging, and I've proposed uh, in a book that I just wrote, is that aging is a loss of information. Not the genetic information, but the information that tells a cell how to read the genetic information. In the same way, uh, a DVD would have the information of our genome, but it gets scratched as we get older. And what this reprogramming does is it polishes the DVD so we can read the genes correctly. And that's what we're doing, and we see that the cells in our, old, in our older bodies, at least in, in the old mice, this, those cells still have the information to be young again. We just need to tell them how to read it again. Well, if you asked me that just two years ago, I would have said, there's no way we can stop aging. Um, and we still don't know how to do that. But we do know now how to reprogram cells to be very young again and take the age, at least of a, of a mouse's eye, all the way back from one year of age, which is an old eye, back to being just a couple of months. So now when you ask me that, I have to say, in theory, it's possible that we could reset the body multiple times. Now, we've reset an eye once, um, but we're now testing if we could do it twice, three times. And maybe we can reset 100 times. We don't know just yet. But that's a very exciting prospect that we will be able to have multiple resets within our lifetime. Yeah, so I'm a, a scientist, um, and hopefully a respected one. And my colleagues get very angry when I say things like, one day we could live to 150. Now, it, you can't just prove that. But what I can say with some uh, reliability is that we've been on a trend as a, a species for the last few hundred years, a very linear trend of greatly extending our lifespan, our average lifespan. And if we continue just on that line without any breakthroughs, a child born over here in the US today can expect to live to 104 on average. Um, and in Japan, it's 108, 109. So that's very exciting. But what I'm really excited about is if these breakthroughs happen that I'm talking about today, then those numbers could be even greater. And we know that there are many species on the planet uh, whales, for example, that can live 100 years longer than us. So there's no law that says we have to all die at 80 or 90. And I know that one day we'll figure this out. Uh, well, a lot of people think that I'm trying to do this research to save myself, which is not, not true at all. Um, anyone who's seen me drive a car knows that I'm not that worried about my own mortality. Uh, but I am trying to leave the world a better place than I found it. My grandmother uh, taught me that, and she said, Humans are capable of terrible things. Your job is to do great things. And so that's why I work hard. I mean, I, I'm in no rush to leave the planet. I don't want to, I sort of certainly don't want my family members to be in nursing homes and have to be spoon fed and bathed with a sponge. That's, you don't want that even uh, for your enemies. Well, maybe you do, but I, what I'm trying to do is to allow people to live longer in a healthier way and the longer I can live in a healthier way, you know, I wouldn't say no to that. And if it didn't protect, if this research didn't protect 
the brain, uh, I wouldn't work on it. The good news is that everything that my lab and hundreds of other labs around the world have shown is that our approach to medicine, uh, to drugs, is to treat the whole body, to turn on the body's defenses, whether it's in the skin to prevent wrinkles or in the brain to prevent dementia. And so the good news is that this is one of the first approaches to medicine that keeps the entire body young so that we won't end up with a situation that we're heading towards where we're just increasing the number of people with dementia in nursing homes while their hearts beat. Yeah, it's a real problem, and I'm spending a lot of my time talking to world leaders and to other members of, of the industry here to, to make sure that doesn't happen, because we could end up with a world where the millionaires and the billionaires have access to this technology. Already they have more access than most people. Uh, but we cannot have a world like that. We, we could end up with a world, a dystopia, where rich people's children and, and even their pets live longer than, than other people on, on the planet. But there are drugs that, some of which are already on the market, for diseases like diabetes, there's a drug we call metformin or glucophage, which has signs of longevity and anti-aging properties. And this drug only costs a few cents per pill. And really, if we were to call aging a disease today, like the World Health Organization has declared old age as a medical condition, then doctors could prescribe a medicine like metformin to their patients for very little money and potentially extend their healthy lifespan by five or 10 years. So it's, it's happening right now. It's just a matter of knowledge and, uh, and the regulations. Well, we, we've, every generation when we've come up with new medicines, uh, people have worried about what's going to happen if we keep people alive for longer. And there's no way we would go back to the 1920s where mothers and children would die from an infected splinter. Um, and so I project, and I, I've done the calculations and written about this, that population is not going to be a problem. We're stabilizing our population. And the, the healthier people are, the fewer children they have, especially in developing countries. Um, and also the, the retirement age. Um, what we're going to be doing is shifting the retirement age, but in a way that people have the ability to start new careers and take on hobbies and things and community work that they've always wanted to do. And it's a trade-off. You can't have longer life and healthy life without still contributing to society, you can't expect young people to pay for it. So we will have to adjust, but we've been adjusting for the last 100 or so years in a way that I think we'd never go back to the old ways. But no doubt things will change, but I think change for the better, because what we're heading towards is a world where if we don't do this, we're just going to have a huge burden on our economies. Already Japan and China, increasingly Western and Eastern Europe, are suffering under a burden of sick elderly. So why not work to make them a healthy elderly? And then the research says that those elderly people will die much more quickly. Um, and someone, for example, who lives over 100 years old dies within a few weeks and only costs one third the medical costs of someone who lives an, an average lifespan. Uh, well, let's again look at history. When, when people lived to 60 instead of to 80 or 90, uh, were their lives better than ours? Did they have a more fulfilled life, or do we have a better life? I would argue that the healthy, longer lives that we live mean that we have a much better time on this planet. And that's what future generations will have. And they'll look back at our lives with pity. And they'll actually laugh at such a thought that we needed to die young and be fearful of, of death for us to have uh, meaningful lives. That's a very Protestant uh, and Christian way of looking at the world. Um, and life goes by very quickly. We're not going to live forever. And even if, even if we live to 120 years, that would go by very quickly. Um, and so, you know, I reject that notion that we need to worry about dying uh, to make life meaningful. In fact, most of us don't even think about dying until it's too late. It is partially. So people who live over 100 typically have a good set of genes, a good set of longevity genes. <clears throat> but we actually know that only 20% of our longevity is genetically predetermined. And the rest is up to us, which is enormously power empowering. We can live our life with exercise, with uh, a bit of hunger in our day is, is a good thing. And perhaps these supplements will give us the boost. So we can all look forward to living over 100 and perhaps one day many of us will make it to that age of 110, perhaps even beyond that.